and suddenly quite a few more people around our outside broadcast unit than they have been in the last hour and that's nothing to do with me it's everything to do with the guest who's sitting with me uh, in our makeshift studio for those who've tuned in very late this afternoon we are coming to you live from the front Shook literary festival if you are in town and you are coming through to a panel please swing by our ob unit you'll find us right in front of the town hall uh, you can spot the navy blue and yellow cape talk banners and come through and say hello and particularly come through and say hello to my guest for the remainder of this half, half hour. Uh, look, he must be pretty used to having a crowd following him everywhere he goes because that is the price of celebrity. You don't become an award-winning screenwriter, actor, comedian, talent show host without attracting some attention. But of course, this is a literary festival. The real reason he's attracting his attention is the fact that he has sold 50 million books uh, worldwide. It's a career that has seen him dubbed the next Roald Dahl a champion of children's literacy. And in fact, he started this year holding three of the top 10 positions of the best-selling children's titles of the year. Uh, he's been tickling funny bones all over town this past week. His name is David Williams, and what a pleasure to have you with us in front, Shook. Welcome. Well, what an amazing introduction. I mean, I think you should just <laughs> follow me around and tell everyone how wonderful I am. I'll be your I town am. crier. Please, please, I need you. Uh, well, I'm saying it all because I mean it all. Uh, I'm a parent of readers. My readers are a little bit past your typical reading age now they're in their late teens and 20s but even they for once were impressed when I said that you were going to be on the okay. show David I mean is this your first visit to South Africa first of no, all? I, no I came 10 years ago and I was on a safari. Mm -hmm. This is, this is, I was on a safari with Sir Elton John. Oh, as one does. <laughs> <laughs> and it. it was, it was very funny. He was a good person to be on safari with because, um, he, <laughs> if they showed us any boring animals, go, no, 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 no. <laughs> I, well, I want to see an elephant. I will see a bird. We've got birds in Britain. Like that. Um, but yeah, he very kindly took a big group of us on okay. safari. So I love that. And then this trip, has been all about books so I've been to Johannesburg Cape Town and now to Frunchuk which I think is one of the prettiest towns Isn't I've it? ever seen in my life she, look she is laying on her finest today with the autumn colours and the sunshiny weather and all that but yeah you have to you have to agree uh, book launch and uh, one of the booksellers was there yeah. and he said to me that your events in Joburg could have been sold out four times over and they still wouldn't have had enough tickets. I mean, David, tell us about the, the South African audiences and how they've responded to you this past week. They've been great, actually, because I, I, you sometimes worry when you're trying to be funny that, you know, that there'll be some sort of cultural barriers mm -hmm. or things that won't be understood or whatever. But it seems like there is such a close connection between Britain and South mm -hmm. Africa. And I'm assuming that you consume quite a lot of British culture here from what people have been saying in terms of television shows yeah. and books and films and things. So it's been great. And I think that I always think the further you go, the more pleased people are to see you. <laughs> I mean, from where, where you live. I noticed that just in the UK. If I go to like Glasgow, people are more pleased to see me than in London where <laughs> I live. Um, it's just it's lovely. And uh, it's amazing to connect with readers from another country that you've never met before and you, and you mean something to them mm. because they've kind of been inside your head uh you know by reading one of your books but um this is the first time they've got a chance to ask you a question yeah. be near you have a picture with you so it's great and you know i'm very lucky because my job people say oh what's it like being famous and what's it like writing children's books you know what the best thing is you get to make people happy mm. and who what more can you ask of life than than making people yeah. happy well here's one of them and i want to share this message with you that's just come through from nikki and ethan saying we are so excited about meeting David Williams. We booked our tickets two months ago already. Nikki writes, my son Ethan has dyslexia and has always been more keen on non-fiction books. David Williams is the only uh, author, fiction author Ethan will read. He absolutely loves his humor, especially loved Robo Dog. He is hoping that we finish Bad Dad by tomorrow so that he can add it to the list of, of, of already read. So they will be here tomorrow morning. Ethan's also a dog lover and has insisted we bring a token for Bert and Ernie uh, to the show tomorrow. Can so he bring his dog uh, is he allowed to bring his yes, dog yes i've Where's said the it's fine organizer? i okay. love dogs david so williams said you could dog. so there we go everyone can bring their pets <laughs> but i mean wh what i love about that that message is that it's a dyslexic kid for whom reading might have been a chore might have been the last thing he wants to do and you have found a way to bring joy to him through reading how does that make you feel well it's it feels very special and you know people stop me and say oh i couldn't get my son it's normally boys i know yeah. this is a different situation because he's dyslexic but they say they can't, couldn't get uh you know, couldn't get my son to read a book until he read one of yours and yeah. now he's a reader. So, you know, I regard my books as, you know, I know I'm not Salman Rushdie. <laughs> I, I regard them as entertainment mm. and 
what I want to encourage most of all is children reading for pleasure. Yeah. Because if children read for pleasure, they become a reader. And that means they're going to read into adult life. I mean, lots of adults never read at all, never mm. read a book. I mean, you meet people in your life who have never, ever read a book. And I think probably they just didn't find the thing that entertained them as yeah. I was a kid. It doesn't have to be um, a fiction book. I mean, I loved all those books about space travel and mm. volcanoes and sharks. And, all that. and I love sharing them with my son, who's 11. But there is something special about being taken on a journey, isn't there, yeah. uh, by an author. And so, yes, I, I, I not only put a lot of effort, obviously, into writing the, the actual story and getting that right, but then I work closely with the design team and also the illustrator yeah. to make sure that the book isn't intimidating for kids. Lots of pictures, we pick out certain words in the text. Yeah. It means every time we turn the page, there is something other than just pages and pages of text, which can intimidate yeah. some kids. I mean, on the su subject of illustration, you were incredibly privileged to work with Sir Quentin Blake for your first two books, I think mm. it was. Ha I mean, <laughs> the illustrations are so important in a children's book, as you said, for holding their attention, for making them want to turn the page and see what happens next. I mean, how do you get to start there? Uh, you were famous as a screenwriter when you decided to tip your toe into children's writing. H how do you land Quentin Blake as your illustrator for your first book? Sir Quentin Blake. He's actually 91 now. Well... The lovely thing was, he read the book and liked it. So wow. it, it wasn't about me being well known or anything. And it was quite a modest success, the first book. It yep. wasn't really until my fourth book, Gangster Granny, that it sort of really exploded. But he just really liked the book. And so he, he, he wanted to illustrate it. And the same with Mr. Stink. So I felt very mm. privileged. He, he did say, I can't go on doing this because, you know, he has his own projects. And also he was getting older and, you know, slowing down a bit in the amount of books he wanted to illustrate. But yeah, I felt very privileged. And it did, I, I you know, I, it really helped me, I think, because mm. it made people think, oh, it must be kind of a serious, um, you know, a, a serious writer, or at least his books may, may have some kind of value because mm. Quentin Blake has decided to illustrate them. I and mean, he doesn't illustrate books he doesn't love. So, because he doesn't need to, yeah. you know. Um, and he looks like one of his own illustrations somehow. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> it's weird because he doesn't with a scratchy pen, and then when you meet him, he's like, he's exactly like that. He's a, such a lovely man. I mean, every moment I spent with him, I adored. But, but the thing is, he said this thing he goes, as an illustrator, you have a relationship with the author's work and not necessarily the author and we mm -hmm. did have a nice relationship but i didn't i didn't stand over him while he was illustrating <laughs> i don't think he'd appreciated that just for anybody who has unfortunately come in midway to the interview you probably recognize the voice already but for the record yes it's david williams with us at the friendship literary festival and yes we will talk about the next book in a few minutes but first I'm interested in, in the, the transition into children's writing because, of course, you were a hugely successful comedian and TV script writer. Uh, lots of Little Britain fans in our audience, I know, come fly with me as well. What, had you always harbored a wish to write for children or did somebody say to you, you should really try that, you'd be good at it? How did it actually happen? Well, I started off, my first job um, was writing scripts for Ant and Deck. Are they well known oh, here? Oh, yes. The, the, the presenters. And they, they, at the time, came from a children's show and they had their own sort of entertainment show on the BBC and that was one of my first jobs writing for them and I wrote for some other children's shows then I started working with Matt and we started making kind of rude humour for adults yeah. but kids still liked it so we would do live shows and things or book signings for our scripts and loads and loads of kids would come and in fact kids still you know where they watch it on YouTube quite a lot and they still like it yeah so I realized there was something about the sense of humor there was something about the over-the-top characters um, that I could kind of harness for the book. But then I realized there was something else I could do in a book, which was take the reader on an emotional journey that mm -hmm. you can't in a comedy sketch. Yeah. So as soon as I started doing it, I loved it. And it was a different experience for me because me and Matt wrote all of Little Britain and all of Come Fly With Me together in the same room. We're trying to make each other laugh. We're also going to perform everything. Mm -hmm. So therefore, we've, we've always got our handle on that and we're acting things out as we write. This is very different, you know, a, a solitary pursuit. But I have a love for children's books. I read them as a grown-up. Now, as a dad, um, obviously, I share them with my yeah. son. And you can really spot the ones that are special and the ones that are not so special but still perhaps enjoyable. But, um, but yeah, so it wasn't exactly like something I'd wanted to do from, like, childhood. But it felt like a natural thing to find myself yeah. doing the difference in writing for 
adults writing for children, writing a children's book that you know adults might be reading with the child, all sort of different approaches. The one thing in common is the rude joke. Uh, I mean, a fart joke goes a long way for an adult and for a child. David, I mean, do you, do you consciously throw those in? <laughs> how, do you have to sort of have, have your adult cap on as well, thinking how will the, the adult reading this with a child enjoy it, or do you, do you focus on the child? I mainly focus on the child, but I think the thing I try and remember about writing for children is that no, is not to talk down to them. Because mm. a lot of people, when they say, oh, I've got an idea for um, children, it's Freddy the Fox, and, you know, he does this, and he says that, and he lives in the woods, and it's like, yeah, it's sweet, but, you know, maybe for young children. But as mm. you get older, you, you, you're you actually very aspirational as a child. You want to stay up and watch the comedy show that's mm. on late at night. You want to watch the film that you're not meant to be watching because you're 12 and you want to watch a, a, a film for 15-year-olds, and you're 15, you want to watch the 18th <laughs> film for 18-year-olds. So that's what I try and try and do is make sure that I'm not patronising the kids. And it's something... You know, my, my literary hero is Roald Dahl, and mm. he reads something like The Witches. It's terrifying. This book is about real witches, he says. This book is about witches that kill children. <laughs> you go, whoa! Like yeah. that. But, you know, as a child, it's like, oh, you're reading it under the bed covers. You've got a torchlight. Mm. It feels a bit forbidden. And that's part of the pleasure, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> David, I mean, a lot of your books have tackled the subject of bullying, and I know you have spoken about the fact that that was part of your childhood experience. Do you deliberately draw on the things that you remember being worried about or that tormented you as a child and pour those into the books, mm. or do you deliberately seek out things that you know are issues for a wide number of children, or do they overlap a lot? Um, yeah, I don't... I, there's not necessarily things that tormented me, but I did think... I mean, bullying's an interesting one, because obviously it affects most kids mm. at some point in their lives. They're bullied or they bully, and then maybe they're bully people they don't even realise. But I did, in uh, Ratburger, I had a character called Tina Trotz, and she um, she was a bully, but at the end of the book, I gave her redemption, mm. because you had a glimpse into her life, and you could see that she had a father who shouted at her and... and and you know made her sad and so she sort of passed it on mm. um to the heroine of the story so I, I and sometimes i i'm trying to deal with a big subject like grandpa's great escape which is the book in front of us that i signed for your son um it's it's about a a grandparent with dementia that's something you know a lot of kids face but mm. i feel like what i'm trying to do is sugarcoat the pill so therefore it's a fun exciting story about a grandpa escaping from an old folks home and sealing a spitfire but at the same time at the heart of it is something quite real mm. and emotional but i feel like don't use the terminology like in the boy in the dress at no point do i say transvestite um or trans I, and and in grandpa's great escape i don't say dementia i just say he was confused and forgetting things mm. so i feel like even if you're dealing with a with a difficult subject you still need to have your sort of child's hat on and make sure it doesn't become I don't know, too much like a mm. textbook and not enough of a story. But, the, but these themes should feed into the story. I don't really think, oh, I want to write a book about dementia. I have some ideas and they start sort of coalescing and then I realise that there's probably a bigger theme that I can explore in amongst all the fun. Now, speaking of the fun, the new book comes out, I think, literally a week from today or six days from today, Astro Chimp, your 41st. And you mentioned earlier that you loved space themes. Mm. You've managed to play in this space this time around. Tell us about the new book. Well, it's it's my first um, comic book, as in it's it's very, it's like a graphic novel, really. But Adam Stower, the illustrator, actually mm -hmm. had to do all the hard work. <laughs> but it's I've always been interested, and I imagine lots of kids are, in all the animals that were sent into space yeah. over the years. So you bubbles. Had, y yeah, yeah. I was bubbles was Michael Jackson's chimpanzee. Oh, sorry, wrong chimpanzee. Ham. Okay. Ham was the name of the chimpanzee. Okay. <laughs> <Oops>. <laughs> Ham. And then there's also a like of the dog that's probably the most yes. famous. The French sent a cat into space. I didn't know it's that. very a French thing to do, isn't it? We sent a cat into space. <laughs> we called her Felicity. Um, and the very first, guess what was the very first creature from Earth sent into space? Wasn't it the Russian dog? No, it no. was not. It was fruit flies. This gets everybody. In 1948, there were fruit flies sent into space. So the fruit flies in my book have gone through a black hole, come out the other side, and now they're giant fruit flies. And they're the kind of baddies. I'm not sure about the science, but um, that's part of the story. <laughs> and it's basically a sort of like Star Wars kind of story, but with 
animals that were sent into space. It's almost like a hundred years' time. They're all still alive. They've all survived up there in various different ways, and now they're kind of battling each other. Cool. So yeah, it's it's lovely, and I, and I think because it's in space, it really suits being a graphic novel. Mm -hmm. You know, it feels like something that would, if anyone's listening from Walt Disney Company, um, is something that would make a great animated movie as well. So it feels like halfway there being a graphic novel. <laughs> A question or comment in on our WhatsApp line. Coming in from Shelley, Annabelle and Billy saying, my daughter doesn't really like your books. What other authors would you recommend? Just kidding. We love your books. <laughs> but I'm glad you I asked, don't, I, don't, I, I don't mind that. I don't take it personally. <laughs> I'm glad you opened the door for me to ask, though. You mentioned Roald Dahl's uh, a personal hero. Yeah. Which other books do you, uh, children's books in particular, were important to you growing up? And do you continue to sort of admire to this day oh yes well i love john wyndham who wrote spooky stories like uh, the midwich cuckoos he was the triffids uh, wasn't yeah, he as well yeah the triffids village of the damned yep. i loved his works i loved that sort of spooky sci-fi thing for kids i loved um things like fungus the bogeyman and raymond briggs books yep. i love the richard scary busy busy mm. world books and I, I read them again with my son um, when I got a little older, I liked The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, yeah. The Secret Diary of Adrian Mole. Um, so it was often, I suppose, the common theme would be humour, maybe mm. apart from the John Wyndham thing. But, um, but yeah, I mean, I, I feel like you never forget the first book you read all on your own. And for me, it was Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, oh. which is why I think it was, you know, reading that was like being hit by a thunderbolt. Yeah. Because it's one of the most imaginative books ever written. I kind of think like Alice in Wonderland is the first sort of children's book that counts as literature in my th theme in my theory rather mm -hmm. it's like over 150 years old now but that sense sets t such a template for what came after i think with no alice in wonderland probably wouldn't have narnia mm. um probably wouldn't have harry potter in the same way so i think that the idea that you can go so deep into your imagination as a writer with a children's book for me deeper than you might as an adult's book because children live in a world between the real world and the magic world, don't they? They're, they're halfway into... I've never actually done a radio show quite near such a busy road. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, uh, and, and I think, so therefore, you can take children on a more imaginative journey. Really, yeah. And the thing was, when I was writing sketches, if you wrote, oh, this sketch happens, you know, in space or something, they'd be like, no way can you do that because it's going to be too expensive, or we can't do this and that and the other. And that's what we came up with all the time because you want to think big. Um, but in children's books, all books really, the only limit is your imagination, mm. which is a wonderful place to be as a writer. How do you feel about reading the book on the page versus on a screen? Um, I, d I yeah. never want to read a book on a screen. I don't even really like reading newspaper articles on a screen. Mm. But then I am um, 92 years old, so that might have something to do with it. Um, you know what? I think kids don't really like reading on screens very much. I mean, 15 years ago, when I started writing books, I thought, oh, I wonder if books will still be around mm. in 15 years, you know. And actually, the physical thing of a book, I think, is important for kids. The illustrations you can't enjoy in the same way yeah. uh, on a screen. And in fact, most, most devices don't even, you know, include the pictures. And I think also, you know, it's a gift. And if you're giving, you know, a gift of a book to a child, do you want it to be on a screen? It doesn't feel quite right, does it? It smell right either. No, no I'm I with know. you. 100%. And also, yeah. there's something as a kid, and even as an adult, when you've got your books on your shelf, and you're like, you, there's a kind of satisfaction of having read them, and the spines mm. are there, aren't they? And you feel quite proud, and you're reminded of them the whole time. Yeah. Or someone comes around, you go, oh, try this book. You know, there's something lovely about physical copies of books. Yeah. And I'm glad they're still thriving so much. And it's great that it can be shared so easily as well. So, I mean, my, as I said, my kids are, are long past the reading age of, of your typical reader. But when I said to them that you were on the, on, on the show today, let's go and root out the David Williams books and, 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 and take a look as a reminder. And we realized we only had one left mm, on the shelf. Well, that's not very late, impressive. Oh, sorry, late oh, out. because the others were all burned. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that too. They've all been lent out. They've moved and between never cousins come back. and not come mm, back. I just almost saying. believe you. But, um, or did they go to a charity shop? No, they went went to the cousins three, oh, six, okay. nine, twelve right. years ago. Why younger? not just buy them new copies? It's better for me <laughs> if they're given new copies. It doesn't make sense to me why you would give Sorry. them out. <laughs> <laughs> the point being they've stood the test of time. Oh, well, the 20-year-old 
loved them as much as her sixty-year-old cousin is now. Well, I feel cousins are loving them. I'll have made it if someone comes up to me and says, "I used to read your books as a child, and now I read them to my child." Yeah. So, there's fifteen years isn't long enough for that to have happened. But I think if your books kind of go through generations, mm. then I think you've done well. You've reminded me of C.S. C.S. Lewis's intro to the Narnia series, writing to his goddaughter. I think it was that I realised while writing this book that you're too old to read it, oh. but the time will come. When one ah, day children's stories will be God, he's so much cleverer, again. Than, so much cleverer than I am. <laughs> I would never have come up with that. He wasn't as funny as you were in writing it, though. So, David, uh, I mean, the book, the next book is Art Astro Trump, as we mentioned next week, literally. So, um, but we brought it forward. Have you bought copies for the literary here? festival? So, anyone who comes to the festival will be able to buy it before anyone else in the world. The only kid so far that has uh, read this book is my son. That's amazing. Because I was given the first copy, you know, yeah. half the press. But we wanted to bring this forward so the kids here could enjoy it. So, um, so it's here. So it's hot off the press. If you are coming through to and one of David's panels, don't we gift it like some people do? Don't think, <laughs> well, I bought it. I'm just going to pass it on to children. No, each child gets their own copy. Okay, this is how this needs to work. For future reference, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> David's here for three panels at FLF. The bad news is they are all sold out. I can see from our WhatsApp line how much listeners are looking forward to coming. Those who were forward thinkers and bought their copies. David but everybody else I think has really just loved the opportunity to hear you talk about your process and a few people commenting on how you make uh, even explaining the way you write uh, sounds so gripping that they can't wait for the next book so thank you oh, for making kind. time thank you to so be much for having me and all the best to you after Astro Chimp what's next a murder mystery my first murder mystery for kids for kids yeah okay. well I've not written any murder mystery for adults <laughs> as well but um, I really wanted to do a murder mystery novel because growing up with Sherlock Holmes yeah. and later Agatha Christie and so there's quite a rich tradition in it with, with in, in the U United Kingdom I'd say yeah. Um, so yes this is very exciting set in the past it's about a little girl detective it's about a very famous detective who dies or is killed and she has to uh, find the killer can't wait to read it. Okay. I'm going to read it for myself <laughs> first. David, great to have you with us. Enjoy the time in Franschhoek, and thank you so much for being so generous with your time this afternoon. Thank you very much.